I invite you to open a Bible to 2 Kings chapter 5 as we're going to begin with our Old Testament reading. You can also follow along in the bulletin, but we're going to be looking at multiple passages this morning as we continue to study God's Word and what it teaches us about prayer so that you and I can become a people of prayer, that our natural instinct and our natural reaction to the things that life brings our way, to the circumstances that we face, would be prayer to our Heavenly Father. And so last week, as we began the study of God's Word, what it teaches about prayer, the foundation for prayer, according to God's Word, is knowing who we are praying to. And we are praying as the children of God to a Heavenly Father who loves us and hears our prayers, and we're also praying to a Heavenly Father that is able to answer our prayers because He's able to do what we think is impossible. And so as we make that our foundation, what it will do is it will expand and grow our trust and our love for God, but also grow and expand our prayer lives. Because if I believe that my Father loves me and hears my prayers, if I believe that He is a God who can do what I think is impossible, then I am encouraged by God the Holy Spirit to bring all of my prayer requests to Him. So this morning, as we dive into God's Word, I want to talk about a way to pray. And I'm being very specific about a way, because I don't want to say, this is the way to pray, and then you all listen to me, maybe, and go out and say, well, this is what pastor said, so this is how I have to pray, okay? What we are going to do with that foundation of we know we can bring anything to our God in prayer, as Scripture tells us, over the coming weeks, we're going to expand of what does that look like when I begin to pray. And so in our Old Testament text, in 2 Kings chapter 5, the setting is that the people of God have messed up. And that's a great summary of pretty much almost every story that's happening in your Bible. Right? At some point, the people of God didn't listen to God. They were not obedient to his commands and his word. And so now they're suffering the consequences of their rebellion, of their sin, and they're being disciplined by God so that they will repent. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, what is happening is that the Syrian empire has grown and become incredibly powerful, and they are now sieging the people of Israel, the people of God. And they have them surrounded. And so the context of this story of Elisha is we are completely surrounded. We've made a mess of our own lives. We are in dire circumstances, and we don't know if anything is going to change it. We don't know if there's any hope for our future. We don't know if anything is going to make a difference. And so in verse 15 of 2 Kings chapter 5, the servant of the man of God, so this is Elisha the prophet, his servant wakes up early in the morning, went out. Behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. You have to understand that because of the story of Exodus in the Old Testament, they would often summarize how powerful an army was by saying it has lots of horses and chariots. All right, so it's kind of a metaphoric language. They're saying this is an unbeatable army that has us surrounded. They are stronger than us. They are greater than us. They are mightier than us. And we're in big trouble. And the servant said to Elisha, alas, my master, what shall we do? And that's a great question for you and I to individually wrestle with. Because there are times in life when we are in what we would call dire circumstances, right? Anybody ever felt like you were in a situation where I don't know the way out of this mess, right? That it was such a great struggle, whether it was at work or relationships with your spouse or with your children or grandchildren or friendships that were um, on the brink of breaking. And we're just wondering, how am I going to get out of this mess? What is the way forward here? Right? And sometimes those circumstances weigh so heavy on our hearts and minds, we ask the question, what shall we do? Anybody ever gotten to the point where you're just like, I have no idea what to do? Right? That's a good reaction. Sometimes you just, and that's kind of what the servant's doing. Right? He's asking Elisha, because it's Elisha. And you're like, well, you're a prophet. <laughs> So maybe you have a secret answer because I just woke up early, had my coffee, looked out at what's going on in the world, 
and my only reaction is to cry out with an explanation point, alas. That's a real fancy way of saying we're in big trouble. I have no idea what to do, right? He's throwing his hands up in the air at the circumstances of life and saying, what could we possibly do? Now he's asking Elisha, because he's holding out hope, well, you're a prophet, you're the man of God. Maybe you could do something miraculous, because Elisha's done a lot of miracles. He's raised people from the dead. He's done amazing things. But when the servant shouts out, alas, it's pretty relatable. There are times where you and I are looking at the circumstances of our life, or maybe the lives of people that we love and care for deeply, and all we can do is kind of throw up our hands in the air and go, I don't, I don't know what to do in response to this. Anybody, here's a way, anybody ever felt stuck because you didn't know how to fix it? Right? Like, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to make this right. I don't know how to put this back together. I don't know what to do, right? And that's the circumstance that this servant finds himself in. Overwhelmed, feels completely defeated, feels like there's no future, there's no hope, there's no winning here. And so his response is to throw up his hands and go, what are we gonna do? Right, now he has a slight amount of hope because he's asking Elisha. But I think a lot of us can relate where it's just, I don't know what to do. Now, because we're in the middle of a sermon series on prayer, I'm assuming you can guess what the technical, correct, you're in the middle of a church service answer is to the question, right? Which is? Pray. Pray. Okay, good. Now I'm going to make you feel all guilty for that, okay? Or at least I'm going to confess my own weaknesses. We'd all agree that we've probably at times felt like this servant. Right, you take a, a look at your life or the circumstances and situation, you feel completely helpless, you don't know what to do. You're, you're just saying, alas, I'm in big trouble. And I've gotta confess to you, my first response is not always prayer. Oftentimes, it's not even the second response. Anybody ever sat down and you just said, I don't know what to do. And then you just said, well, I'm going to think about it for a little while. I'm going to start to brainstorm. Or you text or you call a friend and you say, hey, I got this thing going on. What do you think? Anybody ever done these steps before? Right? You just start reaching out. You're like, oh, okay, that's great. And then you inevitably never like any of your friend's suggestions, but you just ask them anyway. You're like, oh, it's a dumb idea. Right? <laughs> you keep moving down the line trying to find a smart friend. Right? <laughs> and we just, we're doing everything, what? Within our power to solve it, right? To overcome the situation, the difficulty, the circumstance that's overwhelming us. And so I got to confess and join you in this that oftentimes prayer is pretty far down the list. It's almost as, well, I've done everything else I could possibly think of and the army and the chariots and the horses are still surrounding me. So I guess now I'll pray about it and I'll just hope that maybe God could do something. I don't know what he's gonna do because I thought of everything and I still haven't fixed it yet. So here's why I want to go over the couple of weeks of why we are taking time to slow down and study what God's word says about prayer, because I want for myself to grow in this area, but I want for you as individuals and for us as a church that anytime we feel overwhelmed, we're looking at the life circumstances, we feel like the servant, we don't know what to do, that our first response, our natural instinct would be, well, then let's pray about it. Not that it's on the list somewhere, not that it's second or third, but that we would say, as a people of God, whatever we're facing, whatever difficulties in life, we say, here's the first thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray to my heavenly Father, who I know who loves me, hears my prayers, and is able to do what I think is impossible. And we see this example from Elisha. He responds to his servant, and he says, don't be afraid, Jesus. Always the last thing you want to hear, right, when you're the servant, right? Just someone like Elisha come along, hey, don't worry about it. I'm like, well, I am worried about it, right? But Elisha's going to tell us why he doesn't have to. He says, don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. 
for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And that Bible verse is uh, repeated and paraphrased by St. Paul in Romans. It's a very famous line. But if you're the servant standing there, there's a reason why their city is completely surrounded. You know why? Because they've lost all the other battles to that army that has completely encircled them and surrounded them with their horses and chariots. So if you're the servant and you hear Elisha go, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid, which none of us ever want to hear from our friends, even if it might be true. Right? Don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. And then his reason is because the, the number on our side is greater than on their side. You know what you're going to do? You're going to stand there in complete disbelief. Because you're going to look around at the Israel army and go, we're not bigger than them. We've lost every battle up until this point. There's a reason they're surrounding our entire city and army right now. So if you're the servant, guess what you're going to think? That's a ridiculous statement. Of course, I should be worried. Of course, I should be afraid. There's no chance we're going to have a victory here, Elisha. What are you talking about? And here's Elisha's response to the question, what should we do? Right, that question that all of us have asked many times in our lives, what should we do? And here's Elisha's answer. His answer is, and he means it, is I'm going to pray. All right. So verse 17, then Elisha prayed. If you're a note taker, you write in your Bible, circle that, highlight. I know it's a real simple statement, but it is so powerful and important for us, and we grow in our faith that what should we do? When we're screaming that question at the world and at God, and we're overwhelmed, Elisha goes, here's what we're going to do. First thing we're going to do, I'm going to pray. And so Elisha prays, and he says this. This is his prayer. O Lord... Please open his eyes that he may see. Now, I said I was going to teach you a way to pray. And this is the way I want you to pray. This prayer request, oh, Lord, open his eyes. Oh, Lord, open her eyes. Oh, Lord, open their eyes that they may see. Elisha, is an interesting detail, doesn't say... I'm going to pray and then go, oh, Lord, do this miracle. Intervene. Make something happen. All he says is, Lord, here's my prayer request. I want you to open his eyes so that he may see. That is a profound prayer to make for ourselves, for the people that we love, for the people that don't know Jesus yet. Oh, Lord, open their eyes so they may see. And here's what he wants his servant to see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. The Lord made a promise. He kept his promise. He answered Elijah's prayer. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Here's... The reality, the horses and chariots of fire, the angelic armies of God, guess what? They were there the whole time. So when Elisha says, don't worry about it, don't be afraid, because our team is bigger than their team, we're going to have victory, he wasn't going to then just make a prayer request of like, oh, Lord, I hope you really come through with this really big, impossible miracle All his prayer requests is, I want you to see that the Lord is already here. The chariots of fire, the soldiers and the angelic army, they were already there the whole time. The problem wasn't that God was absent. The problem for the servant was he didn't have the eyes to see that God was already there and God was already working on behalf of his people. So Elisha's prayer request is this. God, I want you to open his eyes so that he can see your presence. 
that you, he could see that you are already here, that you are already working and fighting on behalf of your people. So I gotta be honest, this is a, a change in prayer for me. <laughs> because I often pray, and maybe you do too, Lord, I need you to do something, right? Lord, um, I grew up hearing this a lot at youth retreats and things like that. Lord, I need you to show up. Anybody ever heard that expression? The, the Lord really showed up. The Lord really was there. The Lord really was present. And so a lot of times our prayer requests become, God, it feels like you're absent. You're not here with us. So we need you to what? Show up. We need you to come down and do something. And what Elisha is praying here is not asking God, can you you come down and be with us? Can you come and show up? His prayer request was not that, because he already knew what? God already had showed up. God already was present with his people. God already is here. His prayer request was, can you give my servant eyes to see the reality that you are with us? that you are here with your people, that you are with us in the midst of the mess and the difficult circumstances of life, that you are working and fighting for your people. So here's how to pray, a way of how to pray. The first is for yourself. Because a lot of times we'd love to be like Elisha, right? If you're picking characters in the story, who do you want to be like? I want to be like Elisha. I'm be like the oh, man of God. And, and all these things, and be able to see everything and make miracles, something that would be great. But a lot of times in life, the reality is that we find ourselves more like who? At least for me, the servant waking up in the morning going, alas, I'm in big trouble. Oh, this is going to be difficult. I don't know what to do. I don't know the next step. Lord, will you please show up or do something miraculous? Right, so often we are the servant. So the first thing to do is, Pray for yourself and say, Lord, will you give me eyes to see you're already here. You are already with me in this circumstance. You are already fighting for me and defending me and protecting me and working on my behalf. Because what we know from God's word with this story of Elisha is God was already there with his people. The miracle is not that God shows up. The miracle is that the servant has the eyes to see that God is already there. So sometimes we just gotta start by praying for ourselves. I know you're humble Lutherans and that sounds selfish, but sometimes we need to just ask God, God, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. So will you give me eyes of faith to trust you and see that you are already with me in this? The second way to pray, look at the people next to you. Like right now, like stare, you're all staring at me. Take a break, stare at each other, look around and go, oh, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. These are my family members. These are my family of faith. And so sometimes, guess what? Sometimes in life, you're gonna feel like Elisha. You're, just, you're gonna feel really close to God. You're gonna feel encouraged in your faith. You're gonna feel lifted up and you're gonna say, yes, God is good and God is at work and I trust him and I believe in him. And sometimes... There's going to be people in your life, in your family, in your church that feel more like the servant than they do Elisha. And our job as Christians, as fellow believers, is to not shame or condemn each other and be like, oh, you just got to believe a little more. I can't believe you would doubt like that. No, what we need to do is come alongside each other and say, Lord, would you give them eyes to see that you are already with them in this? that you are already fighting for them and working for them, that you are already guiding them in this difficult circumstance. So one of the things we are tasked to do as Christians throughout the Bible and especially in the New Testament is to pray for one another. An incredibly powerful way to pray for one another is saying, Lord, would you give them eyes to see how you are already at work? Now here's the third thing that we need to do. We need to be constantly and consistently praying for people who do not believe in Jesus. 
Right? So we, yes, we want to pray for ourselves to be encouraged. We want to lift our brothers and sisters up in Christ, that they would see that Jesus is with them always. He keeps his promises. He's always with you. He doesn't need to show up. He's already there. But we also need to be praying for those who do not see Jesus through eyes of faith. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is a verse reference you might want to write down. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. St. Paul says this, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, to those who do not believe in Jesus. And then in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes, in their case, the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. He's blinded them to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So that prayer that Elisha makes for his servant, Lord, would you open his eyes so that he can see your presence, right? Would you open his eyes so that he can see that you are here and working in his life? It's not just a prayer request we need to make for ourselves at times. It's not just a prayer request we make for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's also a prayer request we make for the whole world. Right? When I talk about this, inevitably, I get asked questions about, well, what's the next step? Right? When I talk about the Great Commission, Everybody know the Great Commission? Jesus said, that's your job as a church. By the way, they said, that's your only job. <laughs> right? He says, here's your job as a church. Share the gospel with the whole world so more and more people will believe in him, receive his grace and forgiveness and eternal life. Inevitably, the question is always, well, do you have a book that can guide us on this? What are the next steps? What are some good programs that we can set up? Don't raise your hands, but anybody ever asked those questions or just wondered, those, like, what's the next step? And one, two, three, four, and if we get to five, it's probably gonna work, right? As like, that's what we think as. I want you to see, and I want you to agree with me that those things can be helpful. But the first step, the most important, most necessary step for the Great Commission in our lives and as a church is prayer. Because what's the problem, according to Paul, of the program? How many of you think you can develop an evangelism program better than St. Paul? I just want you to pause and consider that for a moment, right? CPH makes a lot of good books for our synod. Do you think any of us pastors currently living are to write a book for you that is better than what St. Paul did? Thank you for the lack of confidence, because I, I agree with you. It's not gonna happen. And so what's Paul saying? The problem isn't the gospel message. The problem isn't the sharing of it, because he's been doing this his whole life almost, right? And he's pretty good at it, and God's done a lot of great work through him. And he's like, we've been sharing the gospel. We've been sharing it clearly. It's not a misunderstanding. He says, here is the problem. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, who is Jesus Christ. The issue is they're blind in faith. The issue isn't the programs or the methods or the strategy. The issue is that they need eyes to see Jesus. And so the prayer request that we began with of, Lord, would you give me eyes to see your presence and your work in my life? Lord, would you give eyes to see in my brothers and sisters so that they will be encouraged and lifted up in their faith and see your work in their lives? Is the same prayer request we make when it comes to the Great Commission and evangelism. Lord, would you open their eyes so that they may see Jesus? So the first and most necessary step for you and I being obedient to Jesus in the Great Commission of seeing lives change and transformed by the gospel. And here's the reality I know from many prayer requests that you have made with me that I hold dearly in my heart for you. It's not just, not just people way out there somewhere else in the world. Oftentimes it's what? 
It's people that we know and love and care about. And here's the most necessary, important step you and I could ever take, is the prayer of Elisha. Lord, would you open their eyes so that they can see Jesus? And this is why it's so important. It's estimated by a lot of research firms that there are 3.2 billion people in the world who are classified as unreached. And unreached, when it comes to mission terms, doesn't just mean unbelievers. What it means is that there's not the message of, God, of the gospel in their language. There's not a church in their area. There's not a, a, a critical mass of believing Christians in their region or country to share the gospel with them. That's a really, really big number. And there are days where I wake up and I'm super motivated to keep preaching and sharing the gospel as far as I possibly can. And there are days where I feel so beat up, I want to quit. And I want to throw my hands up in the air like the servant and be like, alas, what can I possibly do? And here's what you and I can do when we go, wow, three billion people who don't know Jesus who don't have easy access to hear about his love for them. What can we do? And St. Paul is telling us, here's what you can do. You can pray that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes in a miraculous way so they can see Jesus. Another thing that you and I can do is support agencies and missionaries who are called by God to go around the world to bring the gospel to them. I'm so encouraged by our church that we decided earlier this year to say, we're gonna spend $10,000 to Lutheran Bible translators who globally works to translate the Bible into languages that don't have access to God's word. You and I are so ridiculously blessed by how much access we have to the Bible. And there are people in this world who cannot get a Bible in their language. And so I wanna thank you and encourage you as your pastor, like that's a good work. We are making a difference globally. But I also want to challenge us and encourage us to say, what if we also prayed about it? Like really fervently prayed about it, said here, I want to see more people believe in Jesus. I'm gonna make a distinction. I would love to have more people worship with us on a Sunday morning. Because it would mean what? More people are worshiping Jesus. But more than that, I want us to pray about, I want us to be a church that says, we want people to have their eyes open that they see Jesus, whether they come here to do it or they don't. There's a difference. Like, oh, we would be so great if we could fill this room up. Yeah, praise the Lord. Whatever he does with our church, let's praise him and serve him. But a better prayer is to say, Lord, would you open their eyes so that they can see Jesus, whether it's here at our Savior or another church or some foreign country, that we would say this is one of our priorities in praying as individuals and as a church, is we want people to have their eyes open to see Jesus and receive the gospel of Christ. Now here's my challenge to you as you go out and pray. Romans chapter 10, if you have a Bible, open to Romans chapter 10. Because there's two things that God's word teaches us about how to share the gospel. The first is prayer. Pray that their eyes will be opened. The second is God's gonna wanna use you and your life and your words to make a difference in somebody else's life. So Romans chapter 10, I would love to read the whole thing, but for time, we're just gonna look at a few verses. We're gonna start in verse 13 of Romans chapter 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So write that down, circle it, highlight it, underline it, put it with 2 Corinthians chapter four, verse four, and say, this is why we're praying. We want people to have their eyes open to see Jesus so that they can call on his name and be what? Saved. And what does Paul say? It is offered and available to who? 
everyone. So we got a lot of people to pray for, but we can do it. But here comes the challenge for us. Here comes the work of a church. What is a church supposed to do? How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. And then in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So Paul's saying, here's the job of the church, that we would pray for people's eyes to be open to see Jesus and to receive salvation. And he says, here's how they're gonna believe in Jesus. For those of you who want a step program and you want instructions on how to do it, just divide these verses into steps and there you go. So you know, they need to hear the word of God. And how are they gonna hear the word of God? Someone has to what? Thank you, good. All right, some of you are listening. This is great. They believe by hearing the word of God, and how do they hear the word of God? Someone tells them. And here's the real tricky part, guys. A lot of times, God has called you to be this someone, to be the one that prays for them, to be the one that says, here is who my Jesus is and who he is for you. So there's two strategies for how we could be a church that changes the world. We pray and we share the word of God with as many people as we can. One last verse to share with you, to encourage you and to comfort you. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22. God has made a very long promise saying how he's gonna restore and keep his promises to his people and to give salvation and life to them. And he wraps it up, this wonderful promise to them by saying this, I am the Lord and in the right time, I will do it. So don't grow weary in praying for their eyes to open. Don't grow weary in sharing the word of Jesus with them. Because God says, I will keep my promise to save and redeem people. And I am the Lord, and in the right time, I will do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your word that you have given to us that lifts us up and encourages us in our daily walk with you. We thank you that we can go to you in prayer. And Lord, on days when we feel like the servant of Elisha, May you give us eyes to see that you are already with us and working in our lives and fighting for us. May we be a church that lifts our brothers and sisters up in prayer when they need eyes to see you in their lives. And may we be dedicated as a church to praying for the eyes of unbelievers to be open so that they may see Jesus. And may we be a church dedicated to the sharing of your word as far and wide as possible. In your name we pray, amen.